now what is up we're recording now how are you mr banush kapil it is a pleasure to have you on my podcast uh, this has been a long time coming i've heard much about you from siddharth who's on my podcast but then also from gali se gali tak which was probably the only produced podcast i've consumed on rap in india and found myself listening to it on a phone speaker with a friend for 45 minutes in a row as we were rolling joints of course um you know that that has uh, something to do with the, the nature of rap in india um but to you know begin with things a lot of people don't know what is it exactly that you do could you talk about who you are and and um you know how you got here like that sort of thing yeah happy to be on the podcast so i am a uh, i'm a journalist i started off writing lastly uh, like only about music but over the years it kind of expanded into so sort of left wing uh, like left wing politics alternative uh, politics mostly on the cultural fringe rather than you know electoral politics but uh, so i i tend to write about all different aspects of culture and i've also experimented with like like you said i did a podcast uh, <coughs> i'm also i also run uh, like i co-run a series of experimental like gig happenings that we call uh, the reproduce listening room i have i follow them on instagram very very interesting yeah. stuff right? i saw a guy playing a saw a little saw right wasn't that yeah, yeah. that was yeah. lucas akaila he, he's an australian uh, musician so i mean he was just he was in india for a uh, vacation with his family and so we got him down but i mean uh, we tied both rana and i rana runs reproduce i mostly help co curate and manage the events in bombay and pune yeah. we both started this like four years ago because we were both fans of like industrial music and experimental stuff and like very sort of underground noise and stuff like that and we we found a few artists that were doing that in india but we couldn't there was no way to see them there were no gigs no clubs were ever going to have noise artists coming in because it was scared away everybody who was there to eat food and have a drink and that is right. to get their money so after that we got a little bit tired of just wishing that we get those gigs and figured we just put them up ourselves so we started like and we we do it in like non venue spaces because then it's easier you don't have the pressure of bar sales uh, you you can curate freely and also i think it makes it different for the audience because you get you gotten so used to a certain type of behavior in a club right you go in you get, go to the bar you grab a drink you watch two songs you go out for a smoke chat for 10 minutes i mean is is this it become it's become a routine that everyone think, at least like me who's been going to gigs for like 10 years 15 years that happens so i, I feel like the way we do it in spaces where there are no bars and we don't have a stage and we tend to have like people set up all over the space it makes you pay attention to what's happening and listen to the music properly and that's generally our goal to get people to listen rather than just have music as the background to their nightlife activities or to the saturday night out yeah i um yeah that's that's because I often think that that the way the spaces of nightclubs conventionally are designed are used to facilitate uh some kind of a gathering space either at the dance floor or voyeuristically watch the dance from the bar uh and you know and 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 don a cool man cool girl stands by 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 you know holding that drink in your hand and casually surveying what is happening um but but that's very interesting sort of re- reclaiming and reorienting that space to to facilitate only one thing and that is listening to the music i used to run a, a co run a, a music venue myself when i was in boston it was called the garden you know we we stole the name from the madison garden um and we called it the garden of alston because that's the slum neighborhood that we used to live in uh, all the, all the, all the college uh, kids and uh, we would get bands from berkeley college of music uh to perform at at our house and i remember a couple of bands that were pretty off kilter like people who uh used screams and 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 you know even beyond that you know shit gets wild and i saw uh the majority of the casual i'm here for a college show but also to hook up crowd just leave and only the real fanatics <laughs> were were left there so it was just like the band were from new york was playing for about five people who were just jiving with the band rolling all over the concrete of that dirty basement floor and that's when i realized wow there's there's clearly something that uh is different here than than what most venues uh seem to you know um to 
welcome. So, so you, you said reproduce artists, Method India, what else? And uh, I mean, other than that, I'm just doing lots of random projects because uh, I'm, I'm a freelancer and as a freelancer, uh, you kind of have to be like, especially in Indian media, you kind of have to be hustling and have two or three things on the go at a time because it's uh, very difficult to depend entirely on writing commissions, especially after a certain point. You hit a, there's a key ceiling, you know, you can grow up to a certain point and then like, the only way to get more money is to do a lot of work and that's also unsustainable after the point, especially if you specialize in like long form stories which take a lot of time and effort to do. But uh, mostly my main, like the main thing is I'm a journalist. Yes. Everything else is kind of experiments to see what else I can apply my skills to. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I guess for me, how I really got to know you was through the podcast Kali Se Kali Tak and uh, you are uh, tight with uh, Sire Moth and Azadi Records and Prabdeep, the, the whole gang who has somehow revolutionized, um, I guess, all of North India. I mean, the way I see it, I have friends who are fanatic supporters of uh, of Azadi Records and, and Sire Moth and Prabdeep. What, what? But you were also early to the process. You were able, you, the articles that you wrote with Prabdeep were in 2015, Sire Moth, I think in 2016, 2017, something like that. Um, you were on 2018, to... 2017 for because I mean Azadi started in 2017, right? So, yeah, right. the prop one was 2017. Yeah, but but you were on to them way before uh, at least Prabhdeep sort of like entered the mainstream. How were you able to like even track down what is happening like in in terms of uh, this this revolution? So I mean I got started paying serious attention to what was happening in Indian rap when Nazi came out with Apple. I, I knew that there was stuff happening before that as well. Uh, yeah. I knew Ace from Mumbai's finest and like I'd, he'd been sending me his songs for a few years at that point. And you know, there was Bombay Basement and there was other stuff happening. But at that, before Afad, uh, none of it had really caught my attention. I wasn't, uh, I, I grew up as a punk fan and I grew up as more of a, like more interested in rock music. So it took me a while. It was 2000. Yeah, Jim Morrison, the Sex Pistols, that sort of thing. No, uh, well, the Sex Pistols show, definitely not Jim Morrison. Uh, my favorite Jim Morrison you hate support about Jim Morrison. I mean, I, I was just saying, my favorite thing about Jim Morrison is the Tom York quote. I'm not sure if it is a song lyric or a quote, but he says, yeah, maybe uh, <clears throat> maybe if I grow older, I'll become more like Jim Morrison, fat, ugly, and dead. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I am not a fan of Jim Morrison. I, I actually more, I'm not a fan of Jim Morrison fans. Yeah. Which is my bigger problem. Classic rock in general. I have a general issue with classic rock and this veneration of this because you feel like it's too, too, music. it's too easy to be a classic rock fan it's too easy to be a classic rock fan but also a lot of the music is very bloated and very like uh i mean it's not what i'm looking for in music it's very uh self-indulgent and pretentious and like i mean fuck off how much pink floyd can you fucking listen to and i i like pink floyd music but i just like if that is the cornerstone of your identity, then you are going to be a boring, boring I, person. I, I wish I'd met you earlier. I, all my teens, I used to, since I grew up in Faridabad, I used to like jack off to Jim Morrison and then Pink Floyd and all of these guys. But uh, very early on, I also realized that these would become the motifs for several other generic stoners as they come come off age. Uh, so, so then I transitioned into, into other stuff and I've been living a happy life ever since. And then every single time I open my Instagram and I see some 16 year old saying, turn on, tune and drop out. I want to slap the fuck out of them. So <laughs> and, and the other problem with classic rock fans is, is it kind of signals that you're uh, stuck at a certain time period and stuck in a certain period of your own musical development. Right? Like, I mean, I grew up listening to alternative nineties. Uh, grunge and like then American hardcore and punk and stuff and also because I was like <coughs> because I had a lot of time on my hands I was listening to all sorts of other stuff I was for a little while I was very deeply into metal also yeah but as much as I still love the 90s alternative grunge I'm not defined by that right my music taste is constantly evolved and if you're a music fan if you're engaged with music it's like it doesn't give me a good like good sign if your music taste is kind of stuck in when you were 18, 19, because it implies that like after a point you stopped engaging seriously with what was going on in the world of music. 
I mean, That's true. There was a lot of like anti-rap, which I was also guilty of at the po- at that point. Like everybody was anti-rap in the early 2000s in the rock scene, right? But you grow and you learn that there's uh, some amazing stuff happening in rap music also. Same thing with electronica. Uh, people used to be wary against any electronica. So when Pen- Pentagram kind of started uh, using the uh, synthesizers and stuff, Randolph started experimenting with more electronic stuff. I remember they got so much shit. And they got shit thrown at them in gigs. They got so much abuse. And for me, like that particular sort of conservatism is most evident in classic rock. That's true. There's, there's definitely, I mean, there's so many, if you go ever go to the USA, you'll find that there's so many 50 year old men who are weekend rockers and, you know, they'll, they'll wear those, um, those, those cut out vests and then in the, with their bloated stomachs and like, you know, go on and sing with their cigarette heavy voices about songs that only their friends or like, you know, dying groupies <laughs> vibe to. Um, <laughs> that's, that's typically the way I see it, but that's so true. There is definitely, um, uh, an aversion to experimentation that was seen in, and I, and you know, I'm an amateur music appreciator, not, not on the same, uh, level as you, but I also remember when I was listening, when I discovered rock and roll, immediately, I, I, I also wore the crown of elitism, uh, and dismissed anything that had to do with rap, hip hop, or, I mean, electronica back then for me was like David Guetta and like those guys, but. I would. I didn't take them too seriously. And you realize that I mean, I don't take David Guetta very seriously. But uh, you also realize that a lot of this is just coming because all the music criticism and all the you know the writing about music that you grew up reading was uh, done by white men who for whom rock was their defining sort of uh, moment, defining sort of genre. But I mean, because of that, I don't. I'm not a white guy. I didn't grow up in like Seattle or Washington or New York. Why do I have to kind of imbibe their prejudices? I mean, this is basically, there was a big debate in the in music journalism in the late 90s, early 2000s, which was rockism versus optimism. Uh, so rockism is the idea that like if the frame that every music genre, everything is kind of evaluated through the frame of rock values, hmm. which are very <laughs> type of values, right? Which, which, uh, privilege sort of like a, a type of musicianship, a sort of macho posture, a sort of like very pretentious, very like intellectual And so when you, when you weigh rap against that, or when you weigh against m- m- most pop music against those values, you're kind of not engaging with the genre on its own terms. Right. Because rap is not trying to be rock music. And rap is not, rappers are not aspiring to those values. And the people who listen to rap are not aspiring to those values. So uh, that has changed over the last couple of decades, especially because, uh, you know, there's a lot more diversity in music journalism internationally now. There's a lot more women, there's a lot more uh, people of color uh, yeah. coming in and they're yeah. in their own perspective. But uh, a lot of Indian music fans still seem to be stuck on the albums that they found on their college universities like DC++ Hub or local servers. So, which is my main problem with that sort of conservatism, right? I mean, I know classical rock fans who are very smart, who know what they're doing, who are very engaged with contemporary music. It's not like all classic rock fans are that sort of thing. But it's just, it's a warning sign. It's a red flag. Someone says, I'm a big classic rock fan. I'm like, okay, that's a red flag. I'm not entirely sure I want to engage with you too much about music. Yeah. Because eventually I'm going to insult you yeah. person and you're going to get angry. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I definitely agree with that because it takes a certain amount of mind and a certain amount of lack of resistance to understand, uh, uh, you know, even the beauty of jazz or or sort of like the more rustic elements of Indian music, Indian folklore music. Um, when I used to listen to rock and roll, I used to diminish and uh, sort of, you know, put that away as, as something that, that, you know, was not made for my senses, that somehow the escapist art of Classic rock is what I lived and died for. Uh, but that drastically changed after Gangs of Wazipur and it opened the floodgates. And you know, after Oi Lucky Lucky as well, with you know, with their soundtrack uh, that has this Rajasthan Ki Ragani, Tu Raja Ki Raj Dalari. And you know, I mean, there's so many other artists, even in rap for that matter. I remember listening to Akon, even though that was like more like party rap, hip hop sort of thing. And, and then I changed my mind. Um, definitely. And, and it's, it, it helps to evolve constantly, even though there's research that says that 
uh, you know, your music taste is pretty much cemented by the time you're 16. Um, but I think you always have the ability to uh, redefine yourself. But it's like when you listen to those songs that you listen to in your teens or your 16, you will have far more elevated emotions. At least that's what I've seen in research. But um, we could talk a bunch about that. So I think I, that's, yeah. that's a factor of like how much time you have. Because when you're a teenager, you have a lot of more time to engage with music, to engage with musicians, read about them. It's more formative. For me as a music journalist, uh, it's been part of my job to keep up with new music. So it's, my music taste has evolved more. But yeah. for a lot of people, after a point, you get a job. And unless it's like a professional thing or you're a really hardcore music fan, it's very hard to keep up with what's going on. But uh, so, yeah. But to come back to the original question. So I heard Nancy's Afil. Yeah. Right. And that was quite amazing. Uh, I, for me, that song was like, that, a, that was the point where I started paying serious attention to what was happening in rap in India. But it was also like, it was a moment. Uh, more than Mere Gali Me, I think that was the moment where a lot of people started like paying attention to what was happening. Because uh, I don't know if you heard the song or seen the video, but that was basically a track that could have come from nowhere other than Bombay. Huh. Right? It was his first track. It was his debut track. He recorded it on an iPad. He made a music video on an iPad. <laughs> And uh, but it was just like it, it went viral because it was so good. And so I started paying attention then, and I interviewed Nancy. He, he did a couple more songs, uh, and I interviewed him for the Hindu, I think, in 2014-15. And by and then Mere Gali may happen, and that that kind of exploded. And that point, I started paying a lot of attention to what was happening. Also, just before that, one of my friends, uh, Ritwik Deshpande, had done a piece on Dope Relics. So we gone and hung out with them in Harapi again. Gotten very stoned with them and working like that sort of piece for NS7 in. You won't find the piece that's gone now. Because NS7 in has gone with a lot of my writing as well. Uh, but uh, so I, I knew that stuff was happening. And so by the time Prab and all came, I'd already like I'd already written about a uh, written a few pieces about what was happening in rap, uh, largely focused on Bombay. Uh, but uh, I knew Ude Kapoor because he used to work at OML. Ude Kapoor is, and, the of Azadi Records. is one of the co-founders of Azadi. Yeah. And so, uh, and Prab, I'd already come across a couple of his videos uh, mm -hmm. online. So when Ude and Mo started Azadi, I already knew Ude. So I got like, so they, they made sure to send me an early uh, like version of the Prab album. And I really enjoyed it. And so, I, and I really wanted to write about it because at that point we didn't have rap albums. Everybody was just putting out singles, uh, apart from like a few people like on four and few of the more old school guys who put out albums. Yeah. Uh, but those were also more mixtape albums, and they didn't have the uh, those came out before rap became such a big thing. So they didn't have that sort of you know marketing push behind it and that sort of wider interest behind it. So this was for me the first sort of really good rap album that worked as an album. It wasn't just a collection of songs. It had a story to tell. It was rooted in, in a particular area. It wasn't trying to be gangster rap. It wasn't trying to be East Coast or West Coast. It was trying to be Tilakhan. So I thought it was really interesting. And I went and hung out with them. And like, uh, it was great because I'd already done this with Bhatsha, uh, which is like for GQ, I had done like an article where I kind of, I was a fly on the wall. I hung out with him for two, three days. And so rather than just do an interview, I followed him around. I was there when he was doing his work. And it led to a very, very fun, very detailed piece. So I kind of did. And I hung out with him. I hung out with the rest of the crew. Could you, could, 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 you, could, you, could you say, could you say after what you said, uh, a fun and detailed piece? Because I think the audio just went. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, so I did that with Bacha, and I mean. I hung out with him for two, three days. There was a fly on the wall. And that led to a very fun, very detailed piece, which I think yeah. Bacha also really liked because it's rare in Indian entertainment journalism to A, get that sort of access to a mainstream star also. So it was like big up on Bacha for letting me come in and do it, especially once the PR saw my earlier work. <laughs> because I'm not exactly a very positive music writer. Yeah. But uh, so after that, I figured like uh, GQ allowed me to do the same thing with Prab. Like I went to Delhi and I hung out with uh, Prab while he was shooting the music video for Suno. So I yeah. hung out with Prab, hung out with the Azadi crew. I spent like three days there. 
So see them all boys were also there. They hadn't signed to Azadi yet, but these guys are all friends. I met Cez and spoke to him. So it was like, I, there was like three, four days of reporting, uh, which really helped get that article out. And uh, at that point, I already knew that there was something interesting about uh, not just Azadi as a label, but also about the artists on there, because they had this sort of us against the world sort of white, and they weren't afraid to say it publicly, which like as a punk rock fan, I anyway really enjoy, but also I felt like it was needed in Indian hip hop because at a time when suddenly everything is becoming commercial, mm -hmm. you need someone to stand up and say, wait a minute. I mean, we should all be happy to have the money, but we should still be making sure we do things our way rather than just get co-opted by Bollywood and co-opted by the major labels. So I, I thought they were very interesting and I followed their work. And, uh, Uday and Mo are very good at a &R. Which is very rare in Indian music industry. Uh, they're very good at like finding artists, finding talent that fits what they're trying to do, and getting them on board and kind of improving them. So that, which is why I think like somebody like Bobby, who, when I first saw Tianus, when I first saw Tianus, he was a long way from the finished article, but within like months of working with Azadi, his songwriting was better. His live performances were like leagues ahead of where he was. So. Because of that, like I've basically, and because I've written about a lot of this stuff happening, we've got quite a good relationship with uh, the Azadi guys. I see. Yeah, it's uh, one of the questions that, that I had for you is uh, the ability to sort of sniff that, that this is going to happen and then permeating that subculture uh, and then, you know, becoming friends with that. It's it's not exactly something that, that is that there is a set progression, that there is a book which says, Banuj, uh, step A is to go make make, uh, make friends, step B is to talk about it. Uh, what is your process? Like, especially with the Azadi guys, did you simply just show up on their doorstep and say, hey, I'm Banuj Kapoor, I am representing GQ, I'm going to write an article on you. Like, how do you even like make friends? Because uh, what if like personalities don't, ma don't match? What if people's guards are up? Like, what that sort of thing? See, one thing is, I mean, I'm close to these guys, but as a journalist, I have to be very careful about being friends and not letting friends get in my work. So the intention is not to make friends with the people you're covering. The intention is to have like a common ground. Where, you know, they know that you are someone who's invested in the culture, who knows about it, or who wants to learn about it genuinely, rather than just for one 800 word article and then forget about it later. Yeah. And that really is not something that you can fake. And I mean, I'm sure you can train it, but in my case, it just comes from being interested in subcultures. So, I mean, it really helps that I was, I moved to Bombay in 2006. And before that, through RSJ forums and Geekpad forums, I was already kind of like, I knew the guys in the Bombay rock scene and the Delhi rock scenes. And I was invested in it like, from the point of 16, 17. So then I came to Bombay and I was always part of what was happening. I was, I was writing for RSJ back in 2006 which is the Rock Street Journal, yeah. uh, when I was still in college. So all this been around and being part of that one underground scene. And then when, as that grew, that rock scene became the indie scene. Um, I, and as people started, like the same people kind of also started experimenting in other spaces. Yes, it was natural for me to uh, kind of also follow them and see what was happening here, what was happening there. Mm -hmm. And in terms of like just making friendship, it was like Uday I knew because he used to work at OMS. Yeah. Um, OMS knew because I mean, we were all at Raz, half of the OMS crew, especially in the early years, was all people who were regulars at the gig scene and all. But like it was only later as it grew as a company that we started having people come in who weren't a part of the music scene. Because at that point, before 2010, 11 at least, there was no, no real promise of money or a career. So you were only doing it because, you know, you wanted to and you were figuring out how to make it work. So, I mean, really, it's just about being invested in this, in subcultures, investing in finding out the stories that are happening there. And you have to have a personal interest. You have to have a deep interest in in the subject, in like, that has respect for the fact of, of what these artists are trying to do, what they're trying to create. Uh, and uh, artists pick up on that. So. With Azadi, like I knew people, but I mean, I've interviewed a bunch of people who 
I don't, didn't have direct contact with before I interviewed them. But all it takes most of the time is like a five, ten minute, fifteen minute conversation before the interview. Just yeah. like you know, tell them you know this is where I'm coming from. This is what I know. Because just that really makes a difference. Because most people are so used to newspaper entertainment journalists who for whom this is not their normal beat. Just coming in with like a five prepared questions and uh, asking those same questions that they get asked at every interview. So just just the just the fact that someone's come in, done their research, knows what's going on, and wants to have an actual conversation, I think that really helps you get your foot in the door. After that, it's about you doing your research, you making sure that your interviews go well, and putting it all together. Yeah, I've I've seen this phenomenon of people wanting to actually have interesting conversations um, manifest when I do my podcast. Also, I've done a podcast with a. Uh, Lifafa, uh, the very famous Indian musician yeah. now, uh, making the waves. Yeah. And uh, I've done a podcast with Rajat Kapoor, the director of Did, Akhundi, which did Surya has... Khan answer all your questions seriously? Sorry? Did Surya Khan answer all your questions seriously? No, it's interesting. I mean, it's... Uh, the, what I did is I essentially uh, interviewed Mia Bivi, their uh, production film, uh, production company that is both him, Surya Khan, and his wife. Um, and I, I experimented with a new sort of format. I'd never done a podcast in English before, but I was like, I think it's, it's let's, let's go there. I mean, this is in Delhi. Let's, let's really go there. So I did it in English, uh, and it was spectacular. There were moments of absolute rapt engagement where we were debating the ups and downs of TikTok and home homeopathy and music and art and creativity. But then there were, there were obviously times when, um, you know, Someone, someone said in the YouTube comments, like, Surikant looks like a lazy stoner in a fun, attractive way. And I'm like, I, I guess that's a good way to summarize parts of the interview. But I think, I think uh, having, having Surbi on there as well, who's, who's a bit more, um, uh, for the lack of a better word, she's, she's a bit more uh, engaged with, with social issues. I mean, she's, she's, she's been a video journalist, uh, really yeah. helped that. Uh, but no, I, I think I think it was nice. But but the point is that I, I didn't expect uh, to even get that gig, and I just sent them my previous podcast and said that you know I'm just trying to have a conversation, and it's it sort of worked in my favor. So I really believe that if you're really interested in just getting to know that person as they are, and just have like being a conversationalist, interested in them as opposed to your goal for your audience. I mean. Um, do you, do you have certain deadlines or things that you have to meet? Like how much creative freedom are you given when you work with say GQ or uh, I forget other magazines or, or new publications that you've written for, but how much creative freedom do you get? I mean, quite a bit. See, the thing is like with each magazine that I pitch to or each magazine or website or newspaper, I kind of, I'm going in knowing their constraints in a newspaper. There's only so much space that they can give me. And also, it tends to be more of a reported sort of thing. They want more reportage, less feature, also because they don't have that much space. So with yeah. some magazines, like especially with like uh, multinational magazines in India, I know I can't go too much into politics because because it's part of the media licenses. A lot of them like are not allowed to actually cover political news. I mean, like, uh, so I mean, these are, but these are constraints that you know. Uh, generally, creative freedom is is there. You just have to have a convincing article that you send in and you have to be able to defend because there will always be an edit and edits are all these negotiations hmm. between what the editors wants and what you want. So if you, if you can defend your choices of words, your choices of how, how you structure an article or whatever, then I've, I've never really come up across any major issue. One time it was the uh, issue was uh, I wrote a article about like themes album for the national and uh, that there were references to the pigs in Quran from his, in his lyrics that I had to cut out because the national is a UAE based newspaper. But even that was like it was annoying, but it didn't really change the substance of my piece. It wasn't that sort of censorship. It was just these are the constraints under which media organizations in the UAE work. Mm -hmm. In general, I don't think like as long as you know, you know, this is what this organization wants, and you. Know, you, you know how to write an article that will work for their readers. Most of the time, like, especially for culture stuff, there isn't really, creative freedom is not really an issue. Yeah, I also see that you don't mince your words. I, I, was, I was laughing in disbelief 
as I, I saw that Zenzi article you written, that infamous haunt for many of Bombay's creatives in, in, in 2010s uh, of Bandra, where you called Monica Dogra uh, a wannabe high art culture actress. I was like, that's so funny. That's, that's so... <laughs> it's like uh, uh, Zenzi was the place where she and Randolph, Randolph Correa basically met together and formed Shire and Funk. Uh, that led to you know other great great creative uh, collaborations happening simultaneously. I I commend that man. I commend that level of penmanship where you're able to really say what you want. I I didn't expect that level of fairness and truth. I was expecting <clears throat> when I first uh, was looking through your articles. I was expecting something more like uh, you know like maybe like portraits of the environment. This is happening. That is happening. But you're very much a part of those stories. You're very much. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you write from first person, but you're very much there. You you are a part of the story. Yeah, I mean, it depends on it depends on the story, of course. Like, say, if I'm writing about, uh, like, I did a story for Lounge one and a half years ago about uh, Mahul, where a lot of the people from the the Tansa Pipeline project in Bombay. So there were a lot of slums and shanties that were built right next to it. So it high court ordered that they needed to be removed, and they were moved to these BMC flats in Mahul, but there was a lot of pollution there. So that's a, that's not the sort of story I can put myself in. Right. That's why I have to be I have to be a reporter. I'm largely focusing on facts. My opinions are minimal and any opinions that are there have to be backed up because it's a new story. But when I'm writing about culture and especially about like scenes where I, you know, I, I'm confident enough to know what's going on because I've been there. I'm present at the gigs. I know the people. Um, I think it's important for writers to have a voice. And to, to kind of like, you know, it's not the same as political news. You don't have to be objective. I mean, and not that political news is ever actually objective, but at least there you have the obligation to try to be as objective as possible. But it's culture writing. It's, it's, this is not, uh, I mean, as long as you're kind of open about what you think and where you're coming from, I don't think there's anything wrong with injecting a little bit of your opinion, a little bit of where, what you stand for in those stories because that's how you kind of that's how you kind of build that common ground with the reader in the same way in an interview do with the artist like this is how okay this is what he thinks about this so i can understand where his perspective is coming from uh so in that sense I've, and frankly i think that's very important especially if you're writing music reviews which is what i started for a long time that was mostly what i was writing and in music reviews if you're not, if you don't have a voice, if your review is just like, you know, this song had this guitar part and some really good drumming, or nobody cares. Yeah, we live in the age of the internet. They can, they can listen to the song faster than they can read your review. Yep. So then you have to have like the ability to add context, but also have a voice, have a strong sort of opinion on things. Because people are only going to read you if they, if they trust your opinions, or even if they don't agree with you, at least mm-hmm. you're saying it in a way that's entertaining. Uh, and that engages them and that might make them think about what you're trying to say, even if they choose to disagree. And that requires you to be outspoken. And the other thing is like the Indian music scene, especially the indie, independent music scene for the longest time, because it was so small, you met everybody everywhere. There's too much backslap. It's too much uh, keeping quiet when somebody else is doing something really stupid or really terrible. Yeah. So uh, it's important for someone to be like, no, your shit. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I like, I love you. We've been meeting at gigs for the last ten years. We've been having drinks but together. You suck. This yeah. is shit. Yeah. No. If I, you I, don't do that, then nobody. There's no criticism of what's happening. Then it just like there is no check on what's what you guys are doing, right? Because everybody is just like this big happy family. That's not journalism. Then you're a PR person. Right. I mean, that, that's, that's so key, actually. I think, I think one of the harder things to do is when you're friends, because I am also friends with a couple of, uh, well, not all of, uh, I am friends with a couple of rappers, musicians and all of them. And sometimes like they, they put out shit and I've been such a proponent of the music. I, I, it's, it's hard to say it, but I'm glad that most take it really well. Uh, but I like about what you were saying about having your own voice and, and really putting yourself in there. Um, have, are you a fan of Hunter S. Thompson? I think I think you definitely must know about yeah, it. Yeah, I like. Yeah, yeah. because his, his, his style of journalism was Gonzo journalism, where basically he inserted himself in the whole story, yeah. and it became more about 
you know, his his odysseys with drugs with his attorney and and less. But but you like that. You, yeah. you like seeing you like seeing L.A. and Las Vegas through that lens. It's like instead of instead of the city in all its objective facts, you see the city through this narrow uh, pinhole of Hunter S. Thompson's perception, yeah. and you like that sort of thing. But with Hunter, it's also a particular moment in in journalism in culture that he kind of embodied. Right. If I was doing that, it would be damn boring because I'm just not that interesting a person. My personal life is not as out there and as interesting as Andreas Thompson was. And also, Andreas Thompson was a product of everything that was happening around him, right? Right. You're talking about the late 50s, early 60s, late 60s. You're talking about like sort of social cultural revolution that happened and then got beaten back. Uh, so there was a lot happening that he could put itself in there. But there's a reason Gonzo journalism didn't really survive beyond what the seventies. I mean, yeah. you had new journalism, elements of Gonzo journalism, elements of like the rules that it broke. That still survived, but nobody is really doing Gonzo journalism anymore and hasn't seriously been doing it for a while because that moment has passed. Also, nobody's going to give you uh, that much money to just get fucked up on journalism. That's true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. journalism has no money. So yeah, I, I think I think Rolling Stone was especially especially lenient with him. Him, I I've seen multiple documentaries of him fucking around with with the the editor of Rolling Stone. I mean, like, have to say, Hunter Thompson wasn't always a nice person. I know a lot of stuff that he did today, he wouldn't be able to get away with, and he shouldn't have been able to get away with. So you know, as much as I like reading what he does, you also have to engage with like a lot of toxicity that was enabled by celebrating that sort of journalism. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I, I, I think that 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 I discuss. So in, imagine this: I discovered that book and that movie uh, that was made by Johnny Depp um, in my 16s, 17s, and 18s. Bad idea because I propounded that same idea of of uh, benders to all my friends, and we really did it. We 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 uh, we tripped on acid about ten times that that entire year, cons- looking for those sort of kicks one after the other, extending our trips all across India in the hope of finding some sort of an adventure to either document or write with passion. What we got was like incomplete paragraphs, incoherence, a, a lack of just general co- cohesion about what is happening because I don't think, I don't think it was more, I think I was delusional enough to believe that everyone else was doing it with me, but it was just me all along trying to push this one agenda of, of, of sex. No, so and I mean, and, and it wasn't about the, Hunter Thompson's writing wasn't really about the sex or the rugs. I mean, if you if it was you about watch, people, watch Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, yes, because Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas was primarily about that and about like. I mean, but it wasn't about the drugs, right? The drugs were right. there. The drugs were, the were tools, but it was about people. It was about what was happening to people because of these drugs. What was happening to social relations because of what was going on there? It was really a story about what was where the fuck American society was at that point. And about like the, the the sort of social revolution that was happening with the hippies and the counter revolution that was also building steam at that point. So Hunter was talking about social relations. Thing is, if you think drugs are the drugs are, I mean, they're entertaining color and they kind of helped him connect some very weird dots. But the dots were not. The drugs. It was all about like what was happening with people. That that's what journalism is about. People, right? It doesn't matter how you write it. At its core, you have to realize that it's about experiences. It's about drawing those connections. It's about social relationships. <clears throat> so you can do a lot of acid, but you're not going to be writing like Hunter S. Thompson unless you figure out what he was doing. And Hunter had, had a particular vision of the world. He had a particular idea of how the world should be, how it is. Uh, that is what makes him interesting to. Me. Not that he did drugs. That those those are fun stories. Those are anecdotes. So that's great. But I mean, that's not what makes him a good writer. Yeah, I'm I'm glad that I I, I escaped that phase very fast then because um, <laughs> um, that, I I never thought of that. I always thought that it, this is a man who sees the world in one way, and and I, for some reason my fixation was on the drugs he did. But I guess you're right because there are certain passages in the book uh, where he talks about uh, 4 a.m. in the casino. Everyone here looks like used car dealers from Southern California. Everyone pumping away at the American dream. One last bet, one last shot, that sort of thing. Um, it's the critique of American society, which is what the book is. This is what a lot of his writing is. 
like one of my favorite hunters is Thompson Pieces, the obituary he wrote for, was it Nixon? Yeah, I think it was Nixon. Nixon or yeah, Nixon, I think Nixon. We didn't know anything on the Nixon. campaign trail, right? Uh, yeah, uh, but the obituary. Very said it should be put into the sewage uh, drain. Uh, that is a fantastic piece of political writing that I think anybody should read. What is it called? Uh, I'll have to look it up. But it's his obituary of Nixon. Okay. He died. So it was a newspaper obituary. Or a Rolling Stone obituary. So magazine yeah. obituary. But it's a parody uh, like did he actually book. die at that time? Or was it like a preemptive obituary? No, it was when he died. Okay, when he died. It was an actual obituary. And so unlike most people, Hunter S. Thompson was not going to uh, be the polite guy who was not going to speak ill of the dead. He yeah. definitely spoke ill of the dead. <laughs> and it was it was a very honest, very hard hitting sort of political criticism and critique of the whole Nixon era. And that is fantastic. That's one of my favorite Thompson pieces. Yeah. Um. I I wonder. Hold on for a sec. Okay, it's still recording. I just wanted to check if it's still recording. For some reason, it sort of I just uh, stopped in my tracks. Okay, fantastic. Still recording. Yeah. Um. One which. In terms of, because you, you mentioned that, you know, Thompson was a part of a great cultural revolution. Certainly, um, you know, the 70s, rock and roll, 90s, there was, you know, the end of proto-punk. I mean, I don't know, like punk, grunge, something was happening. What what has that moment been for you as a music journalist? Uh, the great cultural revolution or the great music revolution that you felt amazing to be a part of. Is it happening right now with rap? Has it already happened? I mean, at that, we haven't had a revolution at, at that sort of scale, because in terms of the stuff that I've been working with, especially, yeah. it was, uh, even with rap, like, rap is becoming very big, so rap might be that, but uh, it's not happening on the same sort of scale, the sense is not completely changing. Uh, you look at what happened with grunge, and uh, grunge kind of wiped out 80s cock rock and glam rock, right? Guns N' Roses was the number one band in the world one year, and a couple of years later, they were still a big band, but they were no longer relevant. They were no longer the band that everyone cared about. And Guns N' Roses survived, but mm-hmm. Warren, a lot of the like 80s cock rock guys, those guys just disappeared, right? You haven't had that sort of moment where a particular subculture, a particular organization has caught the national imagination and kind of changed how we look at music or what we want out of music. But I'm, I'm anyway, I'm generally more interested in what's happening on the fringes and what's happening at at smaller scale. Because mm-hmm. especially in a country like India, the minute you try to do a massive national level sort of thing, then like economic forces come in and major labels come in. And, and uh, the leeway to really be subversive or to be transgressive uh, isn't there anymore. Right? You can't do a lot of things that you can do with the underground that, and that you might have been able to do as mainstream acts in the US. You can't say fuck the police mm-hmm. if you're like a major national star, right? Uh, you, you can barely criticize the BJP. Uh, so, so the more interesting stuff for me is always happening at like that underground fringe level. And in that, there's been a lot of stuff. I, I mean, the rock scene was really fun. There was some really cool punk and metal stuff happening in the 2000s. Uh, there's some cool indie stuff, Peter Cat Recording Company, and like that little circle they had around their uh, Oscar's house where like Kartik was doing video editing. So basically, everyone in the band was just doing some really cool stuff. That was a cool scene. Uh, I'm glad to see now that they're on a major label and doing quite well. But that for me was very exciting when that was happening because trying to do things like in a grassroots DIY way. Uh, and rap, you know, a lot of what's happening in rap. In the underground scene right now is very fascinating. Like, I mean, as much as I like the what's happening with Azadi, it's great. Uh, and I end up writing about it a lot because that's also what editors want. But I'm also very interested in what's happening like a couple of steps below the Azadi guys because they still have a certain amount of reach and yep. money. And I'm interested in the people who are doing it on their own because there's some really cool stuff coming out of India at the moment. Which doesn't have the the polish and the you know the production polish of of uh, a proper label, but some really cool raw talent coming out, and they're doing like lots of really political stuff, lots of really like subversive sort of songwriting and music that's happening. For me, that's 
for me most exciting being on the ground floor of a subculture and figuring out how things are going once it becomes very big i mean you don't need me to write about navy anymore because a lot of yeah. other people can do it. Yeah. and other people are willing to do it yeah that's when it turns from the journalist story to user generated content you know that you know time to go to the next subculture um i so remember I mean, all of that needs to be covered but for me it's more exciting when it's you know small and grassroots and and it's kind of you've got that energy that excitement that this is something that could be big yeah which is always great but once it becomes a certain size then you know like i, I know other people are going to cover this so i'm going to find something more something new that gives me that same sort of buzz i remember nakab santalis uh, who's a very good friend who's been on this podcast a couple of times uh he sent his uh, track to you and he said that you you love that i've been following his journey for a while as well um and and i like how he works with shows and and uh, delivers old school rap with with a lot of the the, the protest e feeling that he's always embodied w- what do you think is that a subculture that's potentially going to explode so you want uh, who are you talking about nakab santalis the guy who who oh, okay nakab santalis yeah 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 I mean, but like he's rap, right? He's yeah, hip hop production, production. I mean, there's a lot of really different stuff happening in hip hop that I think is going to be really interesting. There's like uh, rap, who does Tamil sort of horror rap. Horror uh, rap. Yeah, I mean, horror rap is a full. Job. So like, the thing is, uh, in the mainstream right now, there's like two ideas of hip hop music, which is the either the Punjabi commercial party rap. Speed the Dalit rap sort of underground, but there's there's a whole cross section of different sounds and subgenres within rap internationally and also within the Indian scene. So I don't know if what Nak- I would call what Nakab is doing its own subculture. It's just part of Indian hip hop. Right. Uh, right. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm I'm excited to see other sounds, more interesting, like more Indianized sounds to get more attention. Like so, Desi is doing some great stuff. the new album i really enjoyed i want to see more of that uh become more mainstream and i think it will but that's all part of the same sort of movement so part of the same you know general uprising of like rap music yeah in in terms of rap music i think what remains uncontested even now is the category that see the moth has created for themselves um on gore bj and and calm both of them what they've created for themselves as you so eloquently put in your own article um that they're not trying to cover broad social issues but they're simply trying to portray what it feels like to be a young person in today's india uh and it's and it's 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 almost like a raw overwhelmingly honest portrayal of who they are and what they experience on a daily basis now they their phenomenon even me as a 23 year old uh, f- i find myself weirdly touched in places uh emotionally that that I haven't been explored before that, that that there's this sort of angst that that is very symbolic of you know being uh, brought up in delhi ncr uh that never really gets explored and and listening to the albums is is literally cathartic and i can attest to several testimonials from not just myself but from my friends who all say the same thing um you have uh, hung out with them a bunch um is is there more to to them then would be here in the rap like what, what do you think about them i mean they're very nice kids they they're they are they great they're very hard working they're very focused on what they're doing and they've got like ah, they've got amazing live energy right you see you see, see them all gigs are the only gigs where you know that there's a mosh pit going to break out i know that i've seen them there's a mosh pit is broken it was the only rap gig you know it has a certainty that there be mosh pits at other rap gigs but mm-hmm. see them all has that live energy that frankly for me that is their biggest strength because that, and they they have the ability to have that same energy in a club with 300 people and at a stage of 5000 people which is which is quite rare uh i really like the songwriting uh i think like the flow is great but a lot of that is like there's a lot of other people who also do it really well it, it's the main thing is that they the two of them together feeding off each other is really great and their ability to you know get under the skin of the crowd and make them move i think that's going to make sure that like that's going to help them go places there <clears throat> there a bad there an act that i think uh, is going to be 
quite big in the next few years as long as you know a lot of it is just luck and things falling your way but uh, if luck is with them and i see see them going along with yeah yeah i mean yeah. that 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 remains absolutely to be the case they have been going like that for a while i i remember listening to their new singles mmm and and uh, the other one i forget its name yad uh, yeah, what is it called yad yad yeah yes yeah. um and and it's like i love how progr- like how more dangerous they become with every single track um but yeah. we, you know we can vibe to see them out more but i do want to discuss something that i feel like sort of will will give context to our conversation um you know bhanuj you've been doing this for an odd 15 20 years right yeah, about around 6 years i think so yeah for the yeah. 15 years now what uh, it, it like this sort of thing doesn't naturally come to people like i already said in the notes like the ability to synthesize patterns from the environment this is happening this is happening and this is related to this uh, there's a lot of lateral thinking a lot of imagination involved like um you grew up in chandigarh how much of your childhood was shaping you up to be who you are today i mean i as with every person all of it but yeah. uh, so my you know i was i was a fairly like nerdy kid in school like i was you know top never really the topper but always in the top 5 yeah But i was also not like oh, someone to fit in into that group because i was always like just to do just about enough to you know make sure i get decent marks but i was never the sort of base to just i i i kind of was kind of a misfit mm-hmm. in the sense i never fit into the jocks i never fit in with the nerds i was kind of okay friendly with everyone but i was never really part of any clique so but that was i mean i didn't really see that as a major thing i was tall enough that i didn't really get bullied yeah that's i really as a 6 foot 4 So uh, I was pretty tall from the beginning. One of the tallest of that. So it was pretty chill. I was largely focused on studies, and you know when puberty kind of hits, and like you start kind of like teenage stuff happen, and you kind of start trying to find your identity. And like the the identity that was kind of available to me is like especially in the early two thousands in like uh, Punjab in a boys' school. It's very sort of this macho, masculine, monocultural sort of thing, and I was. And around the same time, like patriot had come in, right? Um, so I was suddenly like not just restricted to the music I was listening to uh, that I could get from Planet M or Music World, which was still around then. Uh, so I was just like, so what happened is I discovered Nirvana. Yeah. And through Nirvana, yeah. I discovered '90s Seattle scene, and then discovered American hardcore punk and Rat Girl. And so by the time I was fourteen, fifteen, I was moving in a very different direction than most of my friends and peers. and then i also like because of the internet like we found online forums i found like kickpad and rsj which were indian rock uh, forums mm-hmm. and you know some international music forums as well so so suddenly i was i didn't have to depend on my friend circle in chandigarh to uh, talk about music and like i wasn't limited by the sort of cultural exchange that was happening on that local level uh, and that really helped like it helped to know that there were other people like me around the country and around the world Uh, it had to know that there were people making music or like oh we like the vana so we're going to make punk rock or we, you know we're going to make alternative or we're going to make like metal or whatever and they were doing it it was fun they were doing it as expression a lot of it was absolutely shit especially looking back now a lot of it was terrible terrible music but it wasn't really about that but there was no money there was no uh, career prospect it was just like we are doing it because we want to do it and we're doing it because i mean there is a sense of community there's a sense of uh um, like there's a social sort of energy that comes from being in a room full of people doing something that nobody else wants to do doing it because not because it's cool we're not you weren't going to gigs in the early 2000s because it was cool they were it wasn't cool. everybody was going to poison and all so i was going to nightclubs right yeah. i was the early 2000s was in the big nightclubs were happening all the sort of big room uh euro type of nightclub with gleaming metal surfaces and stuff like that so that feeling was great and so that meant that i was also like at that time since it was such a tiny scene that you kind of knew everybody you could walk up to any band you could walk up to zero and happily have a conversation and uh, have a like old monk and cope with them in the parking lot of whatever venue that they were playing at 
uh, because nobody was big enough to have pretension. There were no actual stars. So that helped me really like build networks and you know build relationships, which kind of helped. Uh, because a lot of those people not only went on to become artists, but a lot of the people who were setting up shows or just hanging around like me became music journalists, became event promoters, became like people running labels. So that was great. But like in terms of what you're talking about, lateral thinking, all of that, like how to connect the dots, that just comes from experience. Like my early writing was not very good at all. Uh, Thank you, RSJ never went online uh, like the old issues never went online and nobody can find them now so nobody can dig up how bad my writing used to be when i started but i mean that that really came from that more came more from studying journalism than anything to do with the music scene the connection the relationships were there so it makes it easier for me to connect those dots because i have access to people and i have access to these conversations so you kind of know what's going on behind the scenes but any good journalist in any beat learns how to do that. When I went to Cardiff and I did my master's in journalism and I came back, that is when I started kind of doing that sort of writing. I started like figuring out how to contextualize a particular album, a particular artist, a particular event in larger things. Because by then also you realize that with the internet, the old school, the, the old model of music journalism we were doing in India wasn't going to work. Nobody wanted to read gig reviews because there are videos on YouTube. Nobody wants to read like boring album reviews with you're not doing that sort of contextualizing because you can just click and get the album. So then how do you make your writing interesting? You have to offer them something that they don't have. And what do you have that the average Indian doesn't have is this knowledge of, of the music industry, of, of the background and the, the legacy of different genres uh, and how they've kind of been adapted in India. All of this sort of stuff is really what makes your writing worth reading. So then you focus on that. And that it took me years to get to that point. It was just like, you have to keep writing. You have to get, if you're like, hope for good editors. I had a handful of really good editors that helped me like figure out how to put a story together. Uh, but really, it's just constantly writing, constantly getting feedback. And uh, like, that, any way that you practice a skill, it's the same thing. You have to keep doing it. Yeah, that. I think I think that was a very insightful uh, idea about give, not only just um, writing, but also like advice to young writers who might want to be culture writers and music writers in in in, in the in the future. Um, and never be happy with what you achieve because the minute you are like, I I send off an article and then after like the final edits are done, I don't look at it. I don't yeah. read it when it comes out. I, it's done because. Every time I go back, I'm like, oh shit, I did this wrong, or I could have said this better, or when right. I so really stupid. So never be satisfied with what you've achieved, because that's the only way you're going to drive yourself to get better. Once you think that, oh, I'm a good writer, then you're going then to you're fucked. Yeah, complacency will hit you like a rock, and uh, you'll be washed away out of relevance. Absolutely. Um, now, in terms of w- what is happening in India, your opinion is worth a dime a dozen. Um, which artists slash acts do you think people should look out for as uh, emergent or interesting? I mean, they can obviously read your articles to get like a incisive idea of what that is, expansive idea. Um, but just if you could, for this podcast, uh, talk about like cool acts that people should follow. Well, I mean, it's way too many, right? <laughs> like, it depends. So, I'll just tell you some stuff that I've been digging uh, uh, because a lot of my recent work has been rap. It's quite a rap heavy list, but yeah, I'll give like try and give a bit of a cross section. So, Sidhimat uh, Prabhu Azadi Kru is obviously really good. Uh, there's this guy Awara, but like there's a Lucknow scene that I that I'm very interested in right now. Yeah, uh, which is a rapper named Awara. There's a producer a rapper named Little Kabir, and there's some other stuff. Those guys are very interesting, and it's happening like in its own little circle there. Uh, I really like, uh, like I said, I really like Sadesi, but I also really like uh, one of Sadesi's guys, 100 Abhi He has this group called Rap Hopper, mm-hmm. which is from uh, Amravati, uh, which is like a fairly big city in northern Maharashtra, uh, which is with Arba region, its own sort of dialect of Marathi, its own accent, its own slang. But also, these guys go really hard. So, Rap Hopper, 100 Abhi is there, uh, Darpan is there, and I'm kind of blanking on the name of the third artist. Uh, but uh, those guys are really good. Uh, 
and outside of rap what i'm really enjoying is like so i i really like uh, other oh wait sorry in terms of rap is also park sir which is the kolkata rap crew that i'm really digging these days were they called park circus park circus yeah and so like uh national animal with the producer is someone who came from a sort of punk and metal space and then got into the sort of production that's not always traditional hip hop production uh it's it's very, like which makes it quite exciting and the uh, rapper bc azad is is really really good he raps in hindi and english and sometimes bengali also but i don't really understand bengali mm-hmm. uh but really good like very political we got a very like sort of interesting world view uh lots of humor which i feel like a lot of political rappers don't have so, like you also have to have punchline also has to be entertaining i love the message but you got to make it work as music too uh the other stuff that i've been really interested in is like so noise music right? <laughs> which yeah. is not everyone's cup of tea but you have written a bunch of like stuff about <laughs> noise music uh happening in yeah. bangalore and other parts of the country yep yeah because i mean reproduce listening room we started off with as last part of the reason we started is because there were some noise acts that we discovered and there's no space for them uh so guys like jessup and co uh, jamblu which is kartik the uh, uh peter cat uh, recording company's guitarist yeah uh, he's got a great project called jamblu j a m b l u Uh, yeah i've heard i've heard a single i think i think surakant posted a story a couple of months ago it just came out on spotify check that out liked it yeah. and uh, jessup pinko is like a kolkata based duo kind of make their own sound machines this isro in uh, bangalore which is again like these guys make their own instruments it's like a collective it's not really a performance is thing so much as just like an experimental thing where they do performances on their uh one of the groups but they, like there's more sound art than music but it's some really cool stuff he's got like a guitar made out of neon tubes mm. and stuff like that and heman shri kumar who is i think one of the best at noise music in india uh he's put out a couple of tapes on a canadian tape label as well so you can look that up and now this space is like this noni mouse frankly like i can go on for like an hour <laughs> so <laughs> stop me man like, uh you know noni maus palti shilpi who are like in this electronic song writer space where it's like i i i uh, think we need to start a playlist yes. called manoj couples exclusives on spotify mm-hmm. and i i will help you market it it's going to sell the fuck out i mean it cuz cuz i i mean you should talk to rana uh who runs reproduce because i mean i get a lot of this stuff but because he runs the reproduce social media account he gets so much of this shit It's great. We when we started reproduce, I was quite convinced that we'd run out of artists and run out of interest in a few months. Yeah. But once we started doing it, we started getting so many uh, emails and so many links from people who were just doing it in their bedrooms, doing this sort of stuff, like all sorts of experimental electronic art that wouldn't work in a club. Uh, part of the reason it's been going for four years is because we don't run out of artists to feature. Everybody is like every time someone like gets to a level where they're like, ah, okay, now we're we're getting club gigs and all. They're like, great. found we got three new artists to get yeah. the feature now so there's like a lot of happening it's just a lot of it is uh, niche it's not going to be like uh, rivaling nazi or divine or anything like that yeah i i i, I think so much bigger than mine i i think it takes a certain mind and a certain level of uh, just like general curation with the way you consume music to to get to the place where you're at right now with the artist um wow man i i haven't heard half the artists that you just mentioned and i i consider myself like like a savant among my friends uh, for having a pretty complex a pretty wide ranging music taste that's fantastic but which um in terms of um do want to ask you like this question that can help some people who would be interested in writing further or like just influences what are like the five most important books that made a significant impact upon you your writing the way you think okay so once again it's a lot of books but uh, one is simon rainer's uh, retromania retromaniac retromania retromania okay which is 
Yeah, so that is like, I think uh, Arshun S. Ravi, who used to be the editor of NS7 in, and he's now the editor in chief of Red Bull India. So mm -hmm. he, he recommended that one to me. And it's, it's a fantastic book uh, of music journalism. And so Retromania is about the idea that, like, especially in the late 2000s, uh, nostalgia took over popular music. So, I mean, like, I won't get into the details because it's a book club document, but it was a that's a great book to read to just get an idea of how as a music journalist as a music critic you can build these massive sort of arguments the way he links so many different assets and he's not focusing just on music and what's happening in music he's also bringing in technologies he's also bringing in social changes he's bringing in how uh, our relationships with each other have changed how all of that has contributed to this particular phenomenon that he's thinking so just in terms of as a blueprint for how to synthesize a lot of different things Mm -hmm. Into a story, I think it's a great book. Uh, I also really like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Family, uh, to the Galaxy, uh, by Douglas Adams. I don't know if you've read that. But I've heard of the title. It's, I've heard. Yeah, it's, it's a series of books. I mean, Douglas Adams is just a fantastic writer. So just in terms of humor, in terms of like wit, uh, that's a fantastic book. I really also like anything by Terry Pratchett. Really. But uh, I think what is probably my favorite by Terry Pratchett. Terry Pratchett, okay. Uh, then uh, I'm really into like kind of sci-fi and fantasy and stuff. So I, I uh, one of the books that I really enjoy is Neuromancer by William Gibson, mm -hmm. which was which is, I think like an iconic text in uh, in modern science fiction, especially like sort of digital dystopia type of stuff that's been coming out over the last couple of decade. So William Gibson's uh, this thing is really good. And what else? And one other, I mean, anthology which hasn't necessarily influenced my writing style or anything so much as has just expanded my understanding of like local politics and local culture is like Poison Bread, which is an anthology of uh, translated anthology of Marathi Dalit writing. So like it's called Poison it's called Poison Bread. Interesting. So it's a it's an anthology of Marathi Dalit. Uh, so there's literature, like so there's essays, personal essays, there's uh, uh, stories, there's poetry, and uh, a lot of it is very radical stuff. It's like very grim, revolutionary, radical stuff, uh, very influenced by uh, like sort of like social realism and, you know, very, very opposite to the general sort of picture people have of folk culture, which is, uh, and generally like local cultures, because the Brahminical sort of culture is all very focused on God, music is like devotion and all that. This is very different. It's like showing what's actually happening. So for me, that was very influential because it got me really interested in uh, Dalit culture and like not just Dalit culture, but generally like grassroots cultures of descent. Uh, and so that's also why after the point I started writing a fair bit about what was going on in that space also. Uh, and that's very important because those linkages also really help me make sense of, you know, what's happening with, say, uh, dualist inquiry. Because I used to think that my little upper class music scene was the music scene and it was the scene. Then you realize it's just a tiny little bubble and the real stuff is happening also. <clears throat> so a lot of that came from like that was the introduction to, to to what ended up being quite a journey discovery into what was happening in these cases. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna buy that. Is it available on Amazon or do you have to just? Uh, yeah, I picked it up on Amazon a few years ago. Yeah, Poison Bread, uh, Marathi the literature that is pretty radical. Yeah, I I have been actually I've been looking for stuff to read that is is not from the same futurist technologist writer Steven Pinker esque world and has more of you know like the, the cultural the regional subcontext but it's also in English so I can really guess I, I mean I'm pretty good at Hindi uh, my daddy was a Hindi teacher but um, still there's it just takes a long time to parse through like a novel written in Hindi than it takes to do the same in English um, having said that man wow um, it's been Fantastic to have you on this podcast. I, this has been one of the more spontaneous conversations, despite having um, so many notes. I didn't have to adhere to them at all. It just things just sort of flowed. Uh, you are a treasure trove of information and anecdotes from the world. I would definitely love to Thank have you so much. 
a second time when so the virus ends we can have it face to face and that will do a much yeah. better chat um uh, yeah, man thank you so much yeah thank you so much it's been uh, it was a lot of fun it's great having us chat today yeah um is there a place where people can follow you where you can showcase your work that sort of thing i mean uh, you can follow me i'm stoner jesus on twitter stoner jesus on twitter <laughs> <laughs> yes a lot of editors have not been very happy with that but yeah i'm stoner jesus on twitter and you can uh, check out my work uh, on I, i i tend to upload like the really good articles the ones that i'm proud of at uh, portfolio which is like a website aimed helping journalists yeah. report so you, you, you can access his website from following his original real toned down twitter which is just banuj kapil which is the one that i saw your all all your which on. i only made while i had like a newspaper job because yeah. uh, like it was uh, it's a bit weird to have the newspaper say we've got this article on this very serious topic by stoner jesus so uh, <laughs> that largely <laughs> so that largely only existed for like i only really used it while i still had that job now i i i occasionally use it because they have some professional people who follow there but most of my stuff is on stone juice stone juice okay and your instagram is banuj kapil that's b h a n u j k a p p a l right yeah fantastic um yeah man um, i wish you all the best in this quarantine i hear mumbai is on uh, far worse than the rest of the country so so stay safe um keep writing and um I look forward to uh, seeing more of your articles, and I suggest the re- readers, sorry, the listeners and the viewers, do the same. I want to ask couple. Take care, man. Thank you. Take care, man. Bye. Bye, bye.